Cannabis may be legal and available online, but retail outlets are still few and far between in Ontario. And of those that are open, there have been supply problems. It's left many customers sticking with their illegal suppliers. Here to consider how the rollout of legal weed is going, Abby Roach, owner of the Hotbox Cafe in Toronto and executive chair of Normal Canada. I'm Mark Randall, cannabis industry reporter with the Global Mail. Welcome to you both. Hi. Is it your first time to the show for both of you? Or? It's my second time. It's your second actually. time. Well, welcome yeah. back. And Mark, welcome. Nice Thanks. to have you here. Um, so today an announcement was made. Um, more people were able to sell cannabis. Where are the stores going to be, Mark? So there was 42 licenses that were awarded today. Mm -hmm. uh, 13 of them are in Toronto. Uh, six are across the GTA with uh, two in Burlington, two in Oshawa and several other cities surrounding Toronto. Um, in Western Ontario, there's 11 stores. Mm -hmm. Two are in London and a number spread across the, uh, the west of the province. Uh, in the east, there were seven stores. Uh, one went to Ottawa. Uh, three somehow went to Innisfil, which I'm still trying to figure out. Uh, and then in Northern Ontario, uh, you had one store each in uh, Timmins, in Kenora, in North Bay, in Sault Ste. Marie, and in Thunder Bay. So uh, 42 stores today. And then there was uh, eight stores or eight licenses that were issued to First Nations. Um, these stores aren't going to open until uh, October is kind of the expected date. Uh, but the licenses uh, were, or I should say they were, granted the ability to apply for the licenses. So the 42 people who won the lottery are now gonna move through a process where they move towards getting that license and uh, opening up in October. Well, you cover the industry and um, you expressed surprise about Innisfil. Uh, any other surprises uh, from today's announcement? Um, not, not a ton. I mean, uh, the whole process of awarding uh, licenses by lottery has been somewhat controversial. Uh, earlier in the year, they awarded the first 25 by lottery. That was in, in January. Um, and then they opened in April, or at least some of them did. Uh, there was a lot of surprise when uh, the PC government said we're going to go with a lottery system. Mm -hmm. Uh, last summer after the election, there was a lot of expectations that uh, when they shifted from the uh, the Liberals' plan to have a, uh, a public system for distributing cannabis uh, to a private system, there was a lot of thought that it would be a, uh, you know, many more people would have the ability to apply for licenses. And then in December, they came out and said, uh, we're doing a limited rollout. So 25 to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, in this most recent round, we've seen 50. Uh, so we're up to, or we will be, you know, by the end of the year, up to 75 stores, uh, which is... You know, an improvement from 25, but it's it's not a long a lot. ways to go. You've got a ways to go. Yeah. I mean, when you think about uh, the number of liquor stores across the province, um, or you look at other provinces like Alberta, for example, which is the other uh, large kind of private retail market in Canada, uh, they've taken a much more aggressive approach to rolling out stores. I believe they've awarded about 270 licenses already. Mm -hmm. uh, not all those are open, but uh, a much more kind of aggressive rollout of retail stores. Uh, Ontario seems to be taking a, a, a much slower approach. And Abby, you uh, put your name in the lottery for this round and also the last round. Mm -hmm. um, were you successful today? No, we were not successful. Uh, from looking at the list, it looked like 42 essentially private people, again, uh, ended up winning none of the, the, the cannabis companies that are well known and well versed in, in cannabis retail actually received uh, a chance to apply for a license, which is disheartening. In, in what way? Um, that people with experience, people with want and ability uh, to be able to, to execute on a cannabis retail store, be able to educate the consumers properly, uh, be able to pick a product properly, have uh, quality controls, everything that comes with uh, running a cannabis business, mm -hmm. uh, people who are fully capable of doing it didn't actually get a chance to be licensed. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna end up with more people who probably don't know much about retail or cannabis running cannabis stores, which is to me, um, a problem for public health and safety, first and foremost. Um, this round of applications, um, it, they, it, well, it was a different way to, they had different uh, rules to apply. Mm -hmm. um, what did you have to do to apply? Uh, we had to get a letter of credit of $250,000 saying that we had that available to us, another one for 50000 and then our lease, which was... Um, already there because we've been in operation for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, how was this round different from the last lottery? It was a lot harder to get in, so the amount of entrance was much, much smaller, but... What, was, what were the fees? Uh, the fees were, it was only $75 to enter, but the, the 
letters that you had to get from the banks were very, very difficult to get. Um, I know not many people got through and uh, none of the major banks were writing them out. Um, you've been working in this industry for 20 years? Yeah. Um, so beyond disappointment, uh, how are you feeling about today's announcement? Um, it, it is what it is. Um, you know, we are, we are in a in a crazy time of the cannabis industry where really we have to conduct business on on rumor, um, on on what if, I, I think I read it and my lawyer thinks so. It's There's really no, no other industry out there that is forced to conduct business this way. People would say to me, what's your business plan? It's impossible to write a business plan in the cannabis industry because the regulations are so ever changing and so insane and a lottery to pick a business license like, mm -hmm. there's no other industry out there that would even have to deal with this. Um, Mark, why, how would you characterize the rollout of the legal market so far in this province? Uh, on the retail front, uh, as Epi was saying, it's, it's been pretty haphazard uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, is it because the, um, it's the first time around we're doing this, or is it because there's a lot of caution? Like, why is there something beneath the surface? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it comes back to the, the change in government last summer. There, there was a, a plan in place to roll out, uh, you know, a publicly run system. Uh, that was switched uh, in late last summer, and there was a lot of expectation and excitement about the private market. And I think ultimately going the private route is, is probably the right decision to let entrepreneurs like Abby uh, eventually get involved. Um, but it led to, you know, a, an absolute frenzy of people trying to lock up leases. Um, you know, millions of dollars was uh, sloshing around. Uh, people were signing long-term leases at well above market rates, all in the expectation that there would be all of these licenses granted, as they'd kind of initially signaled. Um, and then came December when they said we're, we're moving to a lottery system. That is, is tied to supply issues in the legal market, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on later in the program, but um, across the legal market, there has been uh, significant shortages in both overall and also shortages in high quality uh, cannabis and high THC cannabis that consumers want. Um, and it's led, at least it, the way the Ontario government has described it, was they couldn't in, in good faith kind of roll out hundreds of stores if there wasn't supply um, to, to fill into those and have people facing bankruptcies, all of that, all that. Um, Abby, the first round of stores were supposed to open by April 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, how many actually met that deadline? Uh, I think it was one. And then, <laughs> really? And then, yeah, and even now there's only 24 out of the 25 that are open. Um, and essentially the one that hasn't opened still has a chance to open. They didn't lose their chance to open and give up their, their spot to the next person in line. Do we know why it's taken so long? I, I don't know, I don't uh, know. Mark, can you fill us in? I think it's partially the way the lottery was structured, as, as Abby was saying. The first round, all you needed was $75, $75 pardon. Mm -hmm. uh, and with, with that low kind of entry uh, fee, you had, I think it was about 17,000 people enter the lottery. So uh, the people who won those first 25 licenses, many mm -hmm. were not people with retail experiences, many were not people with access to capital to kind of get a business rolling in, in the short three month period they had. Um, what was really interesting after the last lottery, and I expect you're going to see it after this lottery as mm -hmm. well, is a number of uh, large cannabis retail chains, many who are based in Alberta, um, went around essentially bidding to franchise, um, get their name on these various cannabis uh, store winners in Ontario. Um, so the rules are such that you cannot transfer the license. So if I won a lottery, I can't sell it right away. Mm -hmm. um, but I can come up with some sort of franchise licensing agreement. So you saw uh, essentially a number of these large chains that are um, some who have 20 stores out west um, who are aiming to essentially uh, spread out across the country, paying exorbitant, amount of, exorbitant amounts of money to, uh, to slap their name on some of these stores. And but the money's up. going to Alberta then? No, no, sorry. To, to uh, pay a lot of money to to franchise and license the store winners in Ontario. So it's kind of like franchising like a McDonald's or a Subway? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a way that uh, with the limitations on the transfer of ownership mm -hmm. that these large, very well-capitalized chains could 
uh, get a footprint in the Ontario market. There was another another kind of uh, rule that that producers of cannabis were not allowed to uh, enter the lottery. Um, but you have seen other kind of uh, licensing agreements between uh, large licensed producers and um, lottery winners from the last 25, which is, mm -hmm. you know, how we have the Tokyo Smoke Store downtown Toronto. Um, that is a brand that's owned by uh, Canopy Growth Corp, the biggest uh, cannabis producer. Mm -hmm. um, they don't own the store, but they have a branding relationship. So I think you're going to see a lot of that in the next uh, 42 licenses uh, and the eight uh, licenses on First Nations mm -hmm. is um, probably bidding wars have already started, or I know bidding wars have already started between <laughs> these uh, these chains to try to um, basically get their stamp and get their name out in mm -hmm. the Ontario market. And, and Abby, hearing all this, um, uh, as somebody who's been working in this industry in this province for so long, um, how do you advocate for yourself? How do you advocate for uh, an opportunity to get a chance to participate in this market? You know, I just have to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, a lot of the hard work that the people like myself put in in the last, uh, you know, decade or two resulted in private retail, resulted in legal cannabis, resulted in in in, in the public change of opinion about cannabis, right? Um, and I'm hoping that the people who entered this round of lottery will get a chance to just apply like a regular business. Mm -hmm. That would be the dream. Um, you know, there's a as Mark was saying, the, there's always a way around the regulations that are created, which shouldn't be, right? Um, there should just be policy that makes sense and licensing um, opportunities that, that, are, that work and make okay. sense. So what people, would a policy that makes sense? Well, having an application that has uh, some kind of merit base to it, um, that would be a great start as opposed to a random lottery that just has random people that will sell their opportunity while people like myself have to keep trying to survive to pay the rent until the next lottery or the next opportunity, uh, which is very, very difficult. You know, uh, companies like my own, we're, we're still open for business, we're still paying the rent, and we have to send two to 300 people a day down to somebody else's store mm -hmm. to do exactly what, what we want to be doing and what we fought to be doing for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And Mark, when you hear that, um, we hear that there's been product uh, shortages, but if you have people like Abby there, um, how does that make sense? It's kind of rooted in the way that recreational legalization rolled out. It didn't, and it wasn't designed to meet the existing market where it was. So we have no shortage of cannabis in this country. There's a lot of people in the, call it the black market or the gray market, the illicit market, who are growing pretty good cannabis and, and have been supplying uh, the country for, for decades. Uh, the market wasn't really designed uh, with those people in mind. It was designed to take a number of large, well-capitalized uh, medical cannabis firms that, that emerged after 2014 um, and essentially hand them uh, the legal market and then also bring new people into the market. Um, so a lot of the shortages are, I mean, they're rooted in a number of things, one of which is that uh, these companies had a, a real difficult task, which was scaling up from being a medical company that's servicing you know, 10,000, 20,000 patients to all of a sudden being able to service a much larger customer base. Uh, in doing so, they, they went around, they raised a ton of money, uh, they bought greenhouses, uh, typically vegetable greenhouses that they tried to convert. And then they tried growing in a very short period of time a lot of cannabis at an industrial greenhouse scale. Um, it hasn't gone terribly well. Uh, the quality is not there to compete with the existing market. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a lot of crop failures, a lot of problems with disease and pests. Um, these problems are not insurmountable at all. Uh, you know, we're very good at industrial agriculture in this country. Uh, we will absolutely get there uh, with cannabis as well, but in terms of the, the ramp up uh, to get supply online is it, it relied on, um, yeah, it relied on infrastructure that wasn't necessarily able to grow. Uh, and then the other point I, I would want to make is uh, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, kind of missing expectations. And a lot of these companies, um, largely because of how they raised money, they went to, uh, banks wouldn't give them money. Um, the only people that would give them money were, um, you know, brokerages and, and firms that typically specialize in high risk, uh, mining financing, oil and gas financing, and certain hedge funds. And all these people, in order to be able to put their money in and out of these companies quickly, demanded that they, you know, hype the heck out of themselves. Mm -hmm. So 
um, these legal cannabis companies, medical cannabis companies, spent the last two years, you know, sending out endless press releases, signing contracts that they wouldn't necessarily be able to fill, mm -hmm. um, telling the market, uh, you know, we can do this, we can do everything, promising the sun, moon, and the stars. Uh, and of course, you know, they're no different than any other agricultural business. They still have to grow plants. Um, so a lot of the supply shortage that we're feeling has to do with the expectation that was created by these companies, mm -hmm. which is a function of how they raised money, uh, versus the reality of running an agricultural business, which is hard. And especially it's hard if you're using uh, plants that aren't, uh, you know, haven't been bred, um, do not have the genetic engineering, what have you, to be grown in these massive greenhouse environments. So, um, It seems really confusing. It, it is. <laughs> and it, messy in a way. It's mm -hmm. really confusing and messy. Yeah. It, it is, for sure. Uh, I, I think the, the simplest way to put it is uh, the opportunity was given not to the existing market. It was given to uh, a group of uh, producers that had access to capital, legal advice, um, lobbying uh, ability. And they uh, raised money by making big promises and they haven't, at least in the short term, been able to live up to these promises. Um, so. I see you, Abby, I see you nodding. Uh, what would you like to add? <laughs> well, also, cannabis is a consumer packaged good now. Mm -hmm. It is a legal product that is sold through retail channels. And I think a lot of the, the marketing, uh, the, the product branding, and the retail is really missing the mark. And for for a consumer to to convert from the the I guess the illicit market, the current market, into the legal market, they have to have a, a product that they trust, a brand that they trust, um, a retailer that they trust, and a product that they actually want. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that on top of missing the mark and and really focusing on capital instead of the product they're also missing the mark in, in how to, to get the consumer to want their end product. So I think that's where the industry has really hit kind of a, a snag, where you've got people that come from pharmaceutical, tobacco, and alcohol running cannabis that most have never even consumed cannabis and don't really understand the culture and are not running uh, CPG and retail. They don't, they don't understand the product. Yeah, the product or the consumer. Um, I want to come back to the legal and illegal market in a second. Um, mm. But one of the cannabis mark, uh, companies that has been in the headlines this week is CanTrust. Mm. Uh, Mark, can you tell us uh, what's been going on with them? Yeah, so they're a, a very large licensed producer that was a medical company that had transitioned into the recreational market. Um, they have got in trouble with Health Canada. They were found to have grown a, a large amount of product, valued at about $50 million worth of product, in rooms that were not yet licensed by Health Canada. Um, this has led to uh, Health Canada investigation, investigation by the Ontario Securities Commission, uh, and an absolute collapse in the company's stock. They fired their CEO, they asked their chairman to resign. It's basically full meltdown mode. Um, it's a very strange story because this company was within the licensed producer, the world of licensed producers, very, very highly regarded. Uh, it was the company that had signed uh, partnerships with uh, firms like Apotex, um, Breakthrough Beverage, which is a big alcohol distributor. Mm -hmm. So um, they're a big player. Mm -hmm. They were a very large player. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a lot of medical patients. Uh, they were very highly regarded. Um, so a lot of people are kind of scratching their heads saying, why would you take the risk? Why would you um, grow in rooms that hadn't been licensed uh, in a very open manner? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure what the answer to that is. Do but you think that that harms the uh, cannabis market mm -hmm. since it's such a new thing here? Hugely, yeah. yeah. In yeah, what ways? In a number of ways. It, it means that Health Canada is going to, whenever there's a big regulatory breach, uh, regulators will go back and look at their processes and probably end up tightening up their processes for everybody. Um, the more immediate issue is this company had gone and raised a lot of money from uh, large banks, RBC being one, a number of banks in the States, Citibank, Bank of America. These guys had been very, these banks had been very unwilling to finance the cannabis space because they said this is really risky. Then they finally, after years, decided, okay, let's go for it, let's jump in, let's pick the most reputable company. So they went and they financed CanTrust. Two months later, CanTrust explodes mm -hmm. in a massive debacle, mm -hmm. which has sent all the bankers and the capital markets guys running for the hills because they no longer want to be involved or they're going to take more uh, 
um, I guess, do more due diligence on the cannabis space. So mm -hmm. it's, it's affecting the rest of the space, not only in terms of perhaps more regulatory scrutiny coming out, but also uh, it's making it more difficult to raise money. Um, and that's on top of, you know, the last six months, essentially capital markets have dried up for uh, a lot of cannabis firms there. It was very easy to raise, uh, you know, $20 million on nothing but a, you know, a napkin business plan uh, a year ago because you could raise that money and then you could go hype it to the market. Um, it, it's becoming very difficult to do that today. Um, so unless you're one of the, essentially one of the big five or six uh, largest cannabis companies, um, the ability to raise money is hard and mm -hmm. CanTrust has made that harder. Now, Abby, what is your reaction to the CanTrust story? You know, again, I think it's a lot of what Mark was saying, and I think they, they were desperate to, to bring back a return for investors, right? So when, again, when you take an entire industry, you regulate it in, in crazy ways that make no sense and uh, make it really difficult um, to, to continue and to conduct business, it leaves people really desperate to do desperate things. And uh, it left a huge company doing something quite desperate mm -hmm. just to, to turn a profit and show their investors that you know, the money was well invested. Uh, let's talk about where people get their cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, Statistics Canada releases a survey every quarter looking at cannabis use across the country. They surveyed nearly 6,500 people and found 42% uh, have purchased at least some cannabis from illegal sources. 48% mm -hmm. have purchased some from a legal source. 29% uh, have purchased a legal source only. Mark, do these numbers surprise you? Uh, at first look, they surprised surprised me at first glance. Uh, it seemed like the uh, four in 10 people buying from uh, illegal sources seemed surprisingly low. Uh, I think it's high. You think it's higher? Much, mm. much higher. How? What would you say? I think the, the biggest thing to note about this is the numbers are not asking where, did, how much did you buy in what channel? Mm -hmm. It is only asking, did you buy a little bit? Mm. Did you buy a gram or a joint from the legal or the illegal market? Uh, I think the more interesting number to focus on is the 30% that only bought from the legal market. Mm -hmm. Because think about it in terms of the alcohol market. Mm. If you have a mature market, it's not like I say, I buy a bit of beer from the LCBO, but I go hit up my buddy's basement for moonshine, right? That's not what a mature market looks like. In a mature market, mm -hmm. the go-to for the vast majority of people is the legal market. So when we say 30%, only 30% bought only from the legal market, uh, that doesn't suggest to me that it's a particularly mature market. Um, I think the other perhaps better numbers to look at when you are looking at the size of the illicit market versus the legal market is uh, some numbers, GDP numbers that came out in the last quarter of 2018, which said of total household spending of about $1.5 billion on cannabis across the country, mm -hmm only 300 million of that went to the legal market. Now, uh, the other 1.2 uh, billion was spent in the illegal market. Now, legal sales have been growing month over month, Health Canada tracks it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have been seeing a steady growth, but it's not like we're, we're, we're starting from a relatively low standpoint, which is, you know, the majority capture, 80% capture um, of the market going to the illicit market, 20% uh, going to the legal market. That was from several months ago. You get a bit of month over month growth, but I would be blown away mm -hmm. if, if we were anywhere close to 50%. Uh, I would probably, I mean, it's anyone's guess, mm -hmm. but um, the, I guess don't be fooled by the number that says 50% uh, bought from the legal market, 42% bought from the illegal market, because mm -hmm. that's not saying where the majority of cannabis is actually being sourced from. Um, Abby, do you think that the cost of cannabis is a factor here in those numbers? Uh, you know, it's a difference of sometimes, right? Illegal cannabis can be very expensive. I, I purchased I purchased some cannabis at a legal store. I paid almost a, a third as much as I would of, frankly, better quality cannabis from an, from an illicit source. Um, but I think really accessibility is number one. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't want to walk, you know, 
blocks and blocks to go to one street that has two stores. Um, and, and then if or you- Or maybe you uh, live somewhere where there's no stores. Or there's no stores at all. And I think a lot of the, the legal cannabis that was purchased was probably online purchases in small towns where, where people don't have a choice. There is there is no illegal dispensary. And uh, maybe you're, you know, there's the one drug dealer that was out of town for the week and they, they went to the, to the website, right? Um, and then accessibility, product variety, those are really important and product quality. Mm -hmm. Those are really important important factors um, and online illicit sales are are very much there. There's a lot of online retailers that can offer fantastic quality products at lower prices and, and much more variety. So we'll see next year when when more provinces get more retail on board, when, when phase two products come into play, which are uh, topicals, edibles, vape pens, uh, extracts, when those come into play, I think that will have a huge change in not only supply, but also product variety. And I think that will attract far more people into the, to the legal market, because right now all you can really buy is, is flour, somewhat of an oil and a, and a pre-roll. That's it, that's your variety, well, just right? To, yeah. Well, just to jump off of what you just said, um, yeah. what needs to be done to convince people to buy from legal sources? Again, accessibility. Mm -hmm. So the, the large provinces that with the most population have the least amount of retail stores, right? Ontario, Quebec, uh, British Columbia barely have any retail, mm -hmm. where Alberta has a much less population. They have, I think, 250 retail stores now, right? Uh, we need better quality products. We need more variety of products. Mm -hmm. And again, the marketing has to be more authentic and, and more in touch with what people actually want. Uh, Mark and Ravi, thank you so much for being here and helping us understand uh, what's going on in the cannabis industry. We appreciate your time. Thank you. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.